It's a great pleasure to be able to be here. I have to say I'm, I'm still like uh, figuring out, uh, am I really here or not? It was just a very quick sort of uh, process of, of coming in from London. Um, you can call me Ale, I know my name is Alessandra, just, uh, you know, I just go by with uh, my shorter version and uh, I'll just tell you a line of the type of work I'm doing to give you a sense of why I'm working on, on, on these issues for now, about, for, for about 15 years. Um, I uh, work on uh, uh, low-income forms of work, both inside factories as well as an outside, uh, particularly in the context of uh, uh, globalized production uh, circuits, textile and garment, uh, most of all, but we've done work, I've done collaborative work on other forms, like for instance, uh, construction. So starting from my uh, sort of uh, uh, engagement uh, with uh, uh, issues of work is where I, I uh, then moved uh, to uh, deal with uh, issues of social reproduction. In particular because it's really impossible to um, deal with these issues of work um, without really starting from what is it that we produce work at the very beginning which is the home, I and mean, from the reproductive activities that regenerate us, first as people and then as workers. Now there's a very rich literature that try to start from uh, this point in order to re-engage uh, not just the history of how we see the, word, uh, the work of uh, men and women, but also how we understand capitalism in itself uh, and some of the categories that we casually use, right, and we take for granted. So this is the literature uh, which is quite messy and is quite chaotic and uh, it has to be pluralized, which is called altogether social reproduction literature, which is having a renaissance, which is great, but uh, is also a literature which is quite old and whose original debate start uh, in the late 60s, 1970s and why we do have hubs where this work has been more recognized and particularly linked to political movements, we also have instead uh, the possibility to trace the connections with other parts uh, of uh, the world economy. So the objectives I have for this uh, one hour where I will just talk a lot um, before we actually manage to do um, some work together is to introduce the concept of social reproduction from the presentation I the sense that some of you are very well versed with, with it. Uh, some of you are well versed with some approaches within that, while instead others perhaps uh, are more uh, 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 sort of acquainted with the uh, uh, concepts like care. So we try to see how we can get a sense of what is it that we name social reproduction. And then we try to map the trajectories and the evolution of uh, uh, the debates. And we uh, try to sort of uh, uh, go through um, different theorizations and what they contribute to our analysis of global capitalism, uh, oppression under capitalism and work. We we'll try to see also points of contacts as well as differences and ultimately what is really interesting is how we then connect these uh, theoretical points to the type of different political imaginary that we can get. So how we connect this with struggles, how it was very much strongly connected with struggles since the very beginning. It was an act of appropriation, the fact that uh, initial campaigns place reproduction up front and how then from their moment, the different uh, political uh, claims uh, uh, that can be uh, uh, sort of waged uh, in the name of social reproduction. To also hopefully by the end uh, have a sort of cartographies uh, of what are the struggles that we can define as reproductive struggles today and how we can use the term very flexibly I would say to account for a lot of what we see uh, uh, happening in the world of work when it comes to activism. I perhaps touch less upon social policy, but it's an area where I'm, that I'm very interested in. You see that I'm wearing a t-shirt that comes from Spain about the La Renta Basica, which is the basic income struggles that feminists are actually leading on there as well. So a lot of this uh, 
politics is connected then to actual demands that uh, we have to then place uh, indeed uh, uh, towards uh, uh, the states and towards capital. Now, if we have to trace the um, history of the term social reproduction, we find it in Marx. There's a lot of debates on where he said it first, which I, I'm sure Marxology experts will find very interesting. I'll skip that. But just to say that when Marx talked about uh, uh, the concept of social reproduction, he mainly referred to uh, the reproduction of labor power, because of course, in the context of uh, his critique, this is what uh, he was engaged with, uh, with his uh, uh, um, sort of critical stance on the classics. So for Marx, uh, the issue of social reproduction was uh, the, the type of mechanisms that you see in a society that regenerate specific forms of inequality in ways that sustain society at large. It's the way in which we organize uh, society and we organize a capitalist society that he was observing in ways that define specific haves and haves nots. Now, feminist uh, uh, scholars, particularly from the uh, 1960s onwards, have reappropriated the term to expand, uh, to expand it far more than uh, what originally Marx actually thought uh, uh, he could grasp, and in particular, they uh, uh, moved the uh, uh, area of inquiry from the realm of production, which was what Marx was looking at, to that instead uh, of the production of the unique commodity under capitalism that Marx instead did not talk about. And this commodity is labor and labor power. If we're able to define how is it that a system works to produce things, how can we define the process of production and generation of us as people? We are the unique commodity that starts the process overall. Um, so now this literature that starts looking at the regeneration of labor and labor power is known as the social reproduction literature. There are many definitions of social reproduction that I can pick on. One of my favorite so you can, we can do these games, you just try and figure out in books which is your own favor, uh, favorite one. My own comes from the uh, feminist geography literature and is given by an author called Cindy Katz and she defines uh, social reproduction as the uh, uh, set of all the activities, uh, realms and tasks uh, that uh, regenerate life on a daily and, in, and uh, intergenerational basis, as well as capitalist relations. So it's that mm, togetherness of things that we do and the realms we cross as people that regenerate our life as we also struggle to work, as we also con contribute to the capitalist process. So within this uh, type of uh, definition, we'll see, we also set the difference between this concept and that of care, which I hope we will work a little bit on uh, during the group, uh, um, um, the group uh, uh, session. Now, there are several different definitions on uh, um, sorry, so several different approaches to social reproduction because it's a plural literature which also sort of uh, look at different things and so it tries to sort of reappropriate ground from productivist analysis vis-a-vis uh, -vis different debates. So we can try to map it also um, chronologically uh, with the start in what I call the early social reproduction analysis, 1970s, domestic labor debate, then we have a very recent uh, rise of uh, a second block of studies, which are known as social reproduction theory. Uh, but, and then I think more, I would say, recently, we have a lot of thinking based on uh, these grand approaches to then sort of uh, decenter and decolonize uh, social reproduction debates away from uh, Western Europe, uh, Southern Europe to an extent, uh, and uh, uh, the US to try to instead uh, put this literature at use for other parts of the work, where for instance I would see my work located, and is what I call the global uh, um, early social reproduction uh, approaches. Also rising, and I think uh, this is literally the last uh, three to four years, is a literature that combines social reproduction with analysis of racial capitalism, so giving more emphasis uh, 
to the connections we have between the patriarchal features of capitalism and the racist features uh, of uh, capitalism. So hopefully I'll manage not of course to be <laughs> exhaustive on this all, but to give you good snippets on the evolution of this debate and how then it speaks uh, to, um, um, to some of the political struggles that we've seen in the past um, and some of the political struggles that we see at present. Now, starting from the early social reproduction analysis, uh, well, the Bible of uh, uh, social reproduction early approaches uh, uh, is considered to be a very small pamphlet, which you find online, and that's called The Power of Women and the Subversion of the Community by Maria Rosa Dalla Costa, was a communist, uh, uh, feminist communist, uh, uh, still uh, at work uh, in uh, Italy, and Selma James was uh, working uh, in the UK as the partner of CLR James, so also connected to a number of anti-racist struggles uh, in uh, uh, that period. Um, the uh, essence of the contribution of this mainly political pamphlet was how we need to recenter the debate on capitalism, not on the factory space, but, quote, from the uh, kitchen and the bedroom, where we produce uh, the primary, most precious commodity of all for capitalism, that is us. There is labor and labor power, and how the nurturing of this commodity is central to everything that will come after. So they were making a very specific point that uh, uh, social reproduction and particularly domestic and care labor inside the home has to be seen as the primary generator of value under capitalism. And they made this claim based on uh, an understanding of wage labor uh, only uh, possible in its uh, regeneration through all the actions and all the tasks uh, that instead the unpaid people that inhabit the home actually made first. And finally, Maria Mies, uh, in uh, her concept of housewifeization that was massively developed also after by Roda Reddock with reference to the Caribbeans, uh, have also contributed differently um, to uh, uh, the debate, trying to sort of highlight the ways in which uh, um, uh, exploitation within and outside the households are connected. Now, the interventions of all these early feminist analysis were particularly on domestic and care work because uh, they also started off as debates within uh, socialist uh, and communist circles. But actually, their argument they were already making is an argument towards how is it that we can recognize the value and the contributions of the wageless in contexts where instead we tend to recognize only contributions uh, uh, instead uh, of uh, the uh, waged. Now, in political terms, this gave rise to uh, a very famous campaign at the time, which still is like living through its many avatars, which is the Wages Against Housework campaign, uh, whose uh, main pamphlets and posters have just been republished, uh, in fact, in the last uh, few years. And basically the idea is, if we're making the argument that uh, women contributions uh, and contributions uh, which are unpaid to sustain and regenerate life, uh, do contribute to value, we demand a wage in recognition of these contributions we make. So the issue is not so much for women to enter the paid labor force insofar as that the issue becomes of the recognition of the work they already perform and it is simply unpriced, is not valueless, is not priced, which is different. Now, of course, the cascade effect of all these contributions, I think, have been great, and I find it still an exhilarating literature to go through, because really it's just feminists trying to take it all back. So, for instance, uh, in relation to processes of dispossession, as I mentioned earlier on, if you read uh, Silvia Federici's uh, Capital, uh, Caliban and the Witch, uh, in the book, she makes the argument that only by going back to the gender and racial roots 
of process of dispossession really understand what is it that we call primitive accumulation in Marxist analysis uh, or just casual jargon if we refer to dispossession is generally considered a process of separation of producers uh, from the means of production so that we free labor force which then can be used to work elsewhere. Well, as a matter of fact, it's very important to ask the question of who is it that is dispossessed and how and in which different contexts this happens. So looking at uh, the uh, uh, Southern European Middle Age uh, period, um, uh, um, Middle Ages period, Federici highlights how the destruction of women's body burnt uh, as witches uh, with the collusion of the church, we are talking in the millions here, actually responded to a process of uh, make sure the private property rested on male hands and also that the release of uh, resources, of human resources for the labor market was essentially a male labor force. So in the process of destruction of women's role, women's uh, economic role in a pre-capitalist society, we have seen their process of domestification, which was very violent and was the reason why you just don't have a separation of producers from the means of production, but you have the creation of a very fragmented laboring class, where some were supposed to be deployed as workers in the newly rising factories, while others instead were supposed to be locked in the home. Now, there, has, there needs to be some qualification to this process. So what this literature did in the reference of Western Europe was to center domesticity, the fact that women are locked into households as the primary vector to understand how the capitalist process unfold. So not just a, a sort of a side effect of it. It was always supposed to be this way. But of course it worked very differently for different cohorts of people. So if you understand capitalism globally, as some women in some places experienced a household uh, uh, sort of has uh, a process of locking in, others instead were denied domesticity altogether and there is a, a wonderful literature on this uh, by black feminist scholars, uh, particularly coming from settler colonial uh, um, uh, states, uh, and this highlighted the way in which, uh, yes, we do observe a relations between domesticity and uh, uh, um, accumulation, but this can vary based on the spectrum of dispossession you're in. So for instance, if you read Angela Davis uh, on uh, uh, slavery and how it connects to capitalism, it's exactly the opposite process that uh, black women went through, particularly in the process not just of slavery, but later indenture, something that also Rhoda Reddock and uh, uh, um, Gayutra Bahadur talk about. Now, so the idea is how we connect the uh, capitalist process with what has been reified as non-capitalist or lying at the margin. And this happens in uh, very different ways. Uh, but basically the main uh, message remains that we need to start uh, from life and processes of regeneration and experience of life to understand phases of capitalist accumulation and how they hit people. And again, the second message still remains uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we need to have an understanding on how value is created, appropriated and extracted, the center, the way in which life was reorganized uh, under capitalism uh, uh, and in this period, of course, colonial capitalism altogether. Now, um, I'll just not spend much on uh, Leopoldina Fortunati's uh, um, uh, work. Uh, it's uh, been reprinted, retranslated, and will come out again with Verso next year, which is a great uh, sort of, uh, um, um, it's great, basically, because the uh, English translation we have is very uh, difficult uh, to read at the moment. Um, my language is a very sort of 
rich uh, over long language where we construct these sentences of 25 plus lines so the uh, literal translation into English is quite maddening to read uh, so this is uh, all been done but basically Fortunati is uh, try to look into the actual mechanisms uh, of how you can clearly demonstrate that uh, you have uh, um, the possibility to claim for uh, the um, value generating nature of uh, reproductive uh, work in different uh, uh, contexts and I'll, I'll prefer to give you examples uh, later on coming from um, my own work. Now the concept of housewifeization which instead uh, from this early period is given to us by Mies and uh, Reddock um, is very interesting also to and it speaks I think to quite a few of uh, your research, pro research projects that tries to map the way in which uh, the realm of paid labor uh, sort of uh, um, projects outside the households a number of disadvantages which instead are generated uh, within and it basically means this uh, with the, um, this concept uh, of housewifeization uh, me has originally tried to um, sort of highlight the ways in which uh, the, we, mm, we devalue uh, uh, reproductive work contributions inside the home as uh, a, a direct connecting line with the processes uh, of uh, hyper exploitation of women outside the home uh, and they connect to explain the persistence of gendered wage gaps everywhere so the fact that women enter professions uh, with the baggage which is already constructed as secondary earner based on the fact that they work for free in so many contexts now um, in COVID times, we have seen further escalations of these processes, and I, I was very glad to hear quite a few of you that are working on uh, pandemic and the redistribution of uh, reproductive work. Um, I think, really, if the pandemic has been a crucial lens into how the crucial commodity of all to sustain the system in which we live in is labor, then definitely reproductive labor uh, is even more so because literally uh, the home had become a place of work but also has become a place where we have socialized the shocks uh, of lockdown living in many different ways uh, with the classic reproductive workers, women uh, in premise uh, at the forefront of this process of uh, sustenance. So if you want, we have seen an amplification of unpaid labor extracted by women on a scale never seen before. So this is uh, the first lens, so this is how the debate is formed in the 60s, 70s uh, and some of the key contributions that we find in the realm of theory there and also how it speaks uh, to some of the political campaigns that went on there. And I'll just uh, uh, sort of uh, speak about uh, campaigning later on in the last part of uh, um, this presentation. Now the second lens that instead uh, uh, is emerged, uh, the center social reproduction as a concept, is what is known as social reproduction theory. Uh, we have another Bible for this, which is probably the edited volume by Titi Bhattacharya, uh, Social Reproduction Theory, that came out in 2017, where we do find a lot of uh, contributions, uh, and particularly uh, her, her own work, but also Nancy Fraser's uh, re-theorization of uh, capitalism as defined by uh, a sort of uh, a number of systemic shifts in the way we organize reproduction. Now, uh, according to social reproduction theory, labor power is reproduced by three interconnected processes, by activities that regenerate the worker outside the production process and allow them to return to it. And these, of course, include the classic uh, uh, sort of housework and, and care work. Second is by activities that maintain and regenerate non-workers outside the production process. Um, so those that are either future workers, that will be our children, or the workers that cannot work no more, that will be the elderly. And then of course uh, the, uh, the third process is by reproducing uh, fresh workers uh, in the process of childbirth. 
Now, a particular emphasis in this uh, second avatar of social reproduction debates uh, is on interplays between class, uh, gender, and race in a sense in conversation but sometimes also in critical sort of uh, stance with the uh, uh, intersectionality theory and uh, um, and also it's an attempt how I read it to redefine the architecture of capitalism from a feminist perspective perspective so in a sense we can call it if you want a feminist theory of uh, governance. Um, so particular, um, in particular contributions look at the way in which since the onset of neoliberalism you have uh, an impact, a specific way of, in which uh, reproductive uh, 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 realms and work and institutions uh, have been reorganized uh, in ways that a continue process of extraction of unpaid reproductive services by certain communities, but at the same time there are ongoing rampant processes of privatization and commodification of reproductive work that is turning it into a paid a realm for paid labor. And I think uh, uh, um, we will hear a lot about this in the uh, days uh, to come as well. Um, it's not so much concerned with issues of value, which has been one of the uh, sort of the uh, uh, controversies that we had um, in uh, um, in sort of in the debates we're having. The extent to which we can argue that uh, uh, this means that we have to reopen the debate about uh, social reproduction being better of value and how we campaign around it, or instead, if uh, they're more classical ways of organizing that uh, uh, we're looking at. Now, the most famous work uh, within the social reproduction theory camp is for sure the one of Nancy Fraser, who has created uh, not just this new way of reading uh, capitalism that is based on phases in which we see the reproduction of life and work shifting massively, but also, in, as she gifted us with the concept of crisis, of social reproduction, exactly starting from observing the transformations that uh, 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 kicked off uh, with neoliberalism. Uh, it's really a hugely rich analysis, the one that she provides, so I have no time uh, and uh, 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 sort of no stamina <laughs> to go through this here. But if we focus, so she identifies three regimes uh, of uh, social reproduction that correspond to uh, phases of capitalist accumulation, starting from the 19th century regime of liberal competitive capitalism, uh, which characterized uh, uh, industrial exploitation in core uh, uh, economies while ongoing processes of colonial expropriation and plunder were going on and so the process was characterized by the domestication of some women in some contexts but then the extraction of uh, reproductive labor including biological uh, uh, um, childbirth in other parts of the world. We have uh, uh, a second regime of state-managed capitalism and when we get to the neoliberal phase of the 1980s is where Fraser takes her time and explains uh, um, what she means with the neoliberal social reproductive regime. It is a regime whereby the state becomes extremely slim and so uh, this has a cascade effect in generating care gaps in uh, uh, different economies. So the crisis of care uh, starts from uh, a crisis of social reproduction where you see a retreat of the state from public spending, from service provision and uh, the ways in which these gaps uh, are filled of course uh, change across the history of, uh, well across the, the, the cartography of uh, work capitalism but you do observe either processes of intensification of unpaid labor at work so more is asked of women and those that perform unpaid tasks or you find new forms of commodification of uh, reproductive work but this process of constant production of gaps right uh, 
uh, as the state retreats is what characterize uh, the uh, neoliberal uh, phase. And there are some uh, wonderful authors that write about this, how this linked uh, with the uh, processes of, enter, of en entry of finance into our homes uh, in different ways. So for the US, for instance, you can think of in terms of uh, the rise uh, and ballooning of uh, uh, consumer uh, consumption-based finance, so the households become more and more dependent on uh, uh, consumption-based debt, right? And this would be the case for the UK as well. And in countries like Brazil, uh, instead, if you read the uh, wonderful work by Elena Lavinas, she will tell you, uh, she will map how uh, social security programs uh, were, were used as a way to financialize uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, reproduction inside the household. So that you could use literally la bolsa familia, so the, the, the um, social security disbursement as collateral to get loans, which means effectively that you're just uh, entangling life uh, even for, well, for the lower, uh, 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 for the lower classes and working classes, you're entangling more and more uh, finance into the way in which we live, and also you're entangling debt in the way in which uh, we live. And for instance, the issue of debt and how it connects to this process is something which is uh, very much discussed in the Latin American context, for instance, in Argentina, when they're experiencing yet another debt crisis. Uh, and, uh, it great book on that is the feminist reading of that by uh, Veronica Gago and Lucy Cavallero. Um, the, uh, this part was less uh, sort of picked on in your presentation, so probably I'll um, skip um, over it. Um, but basically a second contribution of this literature in how can we think class uh, in ways which uh, uh, connect with gender and race, uh, not uh, in uh, a sort of uh, um, um, partial way, not just in descriptive way. So how uh, we have to understand processes of class formation as directly co-constituted through uh, the differences uh, uh, of gender and race that characterize us as people. Uh, and in a sense, it's uh, still unclear to me, in fact, uh, how this particular contribution of social reproduction theory uh, differ, if at all, from intersectionality uh, analysis. But their own, uh, the claim of this literature is that this is a way to center class uh, in ways which, however, are not uh, uh, reductionist. In my view, this is uh, perhaps the, less, the least successful <laughs> sort of uh, um, 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 part of the project of social reproduction theory, and it's still ongoing. But there are a number of uh, great contributions that you can uh, uh, um, look at and explore if your project engages with this. So for instance, uh, Ashley Borer's. Uh, uh, um, Marxism and intersectionality uh, book. Now, what I really think instead, social reproduction uh, theory is uh, um, sort of uh, providing us with is uh, a lens where we can sort of uh, talk about more broadly about the role of sexuality in uh, uh, sort of paving the very foundation of capitalism in ways that also sort of uh, uh, go beyond the classic uh, gender uh, binary. Uh, so uh, there has been quite uh, a, a, an interesting uh, interplay between uh, the literature on social reproduction theory and uh, queer studies uh, going back to what was uh, the uh, early debate between uh, um, Nancy Fraser and Judith Butler on uh, um, the um, uh, redistribution, redistributed, redistributed struggle versus uh, um, recognition struggle. So I think a very productive line of inquiry in my view from this point of view is that this literature is rethinking this binomy recognition redistribution and representing it as a false dichotomy. Uh, so the debate went along these lines when you know there was an issue taken with uh, uh, gender studies over focusing on women and not uh, speaking to LGBTQ plus 
issues. Uh, there was, uh, this was something put forward by Judith Butler in the 90s to which Nancy Fraser argued that these are very important struggles, the one that the LGBTQ plus communities was leading, but these were struggles over recognition and not redistribution like women were fighting. And uh, um, I would say that this is becoming very clearly a false dichotomy. As we see, uh, we get more data, for instance, on where LGBTQ club plus work is located, which is at the margins of uh, processes uh, of employment and work. We have the over-representation into invisibilized forms of work. Uh, and so definitely there is a very strong link between recognition and redistribution. And overall, you know, you do have uh, that the two are inseparable. Also, sexuality is part of the uh, mode of production uh, under capitalism because heteronormativity plays uh, a fundamental role. So the heterosexual family is the unit of economic analysis on which uh, the entire apparatus uh, of uh, 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 capitalist accumulation uh, uh, regenerates itself. So it's true that in some parts you would see that uh, this focus on heteronormativity is loosening out, but uh, um, it's loosening out in a way where even queer identity or non-binary identity or trans identities indeed have to be performed in ways that are supportive of the neoliberal project. So if you, are, you can be nowadays a good consumer from a neoliberal point of view in different parts of the planet, but it's just that the uh, extent to which you can re renegotiate this identity is very limited and is very much embedded in whiteness, in class elitarianism, and it doesn't really challenge the uh, foundation of who is it that uh, is uh, 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 the have not uh, uh, under the uh, capitalist uh, uh, project. Recently, uh, you had much more of an effort to link debates on social reproduction with debates on racial capitalism. Now, even if you look back at the 1970s, you can all, always see that because much of the social reproduction debate took place in the context of uh, anti-racist uh, debates uh, uh, in the context of these circles where these uh, uh, feminists uh, put forward their ideas, race was an element that was uh, present and massively so and is still leading, for instance, if you look at Selma James' ongoing campaigning on the wages against housework in parts of, uh, uh, in many parts of the world, we have, there is project going on in Indonesia and there's a lot of debates going on in India at the moment, uh, also led uh, by Prabha Kotisvaran. Um, so there is an element there, but I would say that in the last five years there is more of an effort to actually spell out these uh, linkages more clearly and particularly to place this literature in conversation with uh, the literature on racial capitalism as developed first by Cedric Robinson in the 80s. And one book which is quite uh, uh, um, striking in this respect is the definitely recent work of uh, Gargi Bhattacharya, two different Bhattacharya, this is double Y, uh, on rethinking racial capitalism. Well, she tries to go back to uh, Robinson's ideas uh, and highlight uh, how that will look like that argument on racial capitalism if we were to account of the differential experience uh, of black women in different contexts. Uh, so this is uh, sort of a very interesting development of the literature also because it speaks massively to an exciting new wave of uh, black feminist work on slavery. Uh, Jennifer Morgan, uh, Stella Dazie, they have published in the last five years extraordinary account of reproductive violence under slavery and highlighted the differences in relation to the experience of uh, uh, um, female slaves uh, in different parts uh, of the world and at different moments of the evolution of the slave economy and its connection to early capitalism. And also it speaks uh, very much about uh, in my view, uh, well, the relevance of, of centering issues of uh, 
racialization and exclusion when we talk about social reproduction uh, has escalated massively in my view during COVID where we have seen really um, <laughs> pose before us uh, what the ultimate reproductive question really is, which is uh, who is it that dies of capitalism first when crisis hit? So basically COVID has uh, in a very short span of three years really given us some very scary answers to these questions and particularly in formal settler colonial states. In the UK where I live we have seen that uh, uh, black people and people of color with the exclusion of ethnic Chinese have died 3.5 times more than their white counterparts uh, considering that they're just above 10 percent of the population that is really a scary outcome and uh, it, it, the British Medical Association itself uh, has taken upon themselves to discuss this uh, as something which cannot be explained by uh, comorbidities alone. So of course it has to be considered in the context of the types of work and the types of uh, trajectories that people entered as the first lockdowns were called and how they were more or less exposed to infectious, the infectious disease as well as uh, how they were accessing or not accessing the health system or how they were working themselves the health system and in which sort of roles. So we had the, for instance, the death of a lot of uh, uh, frontline workers uh, um, in the NHS. In the United States we have seen similar uh, outcomes but in the United States we're looking at the privatized healthcare sector so you'd see uh, that certain outcomes uh, uh, in a context where you have an overrepresentation of non-white people uh, are below the poverty line are far more um, explainable than instead in the UK context and instead we have seen this process of connections uh, that have taken place. We supposedly in the UK enjoy still, um, we'll see after this rotten government has finished his work, but for now we still enjoy public, uh, uh, publicly funded uh, uh, health systems. So I just uh, um, really sort of learned a huge amount from using this lens uh, that is, uh, can be called as a raised social reproduction approach lens in the analysis of, of COVID in the last uh, years, um, which I have to say have taken much of my uh, time. Now, I'll just uh, um, directly move uh, to the fourth approach where I'll be able to sort of go back to issues of value from a different uh, trajectory because uh, um, we have s uh, sort of uh, listened to many things today so I think it's nice also to sort of uh, uh, not overburden us all with uh, uh, huge amounts of information. So for now we have seen three lenses. We started from the 70s when we have the domestic labor debate and what it meant theoretically and politically. We sh shot into social reproduction theory uh, and then we went through race social reproduction approaches. And finally I would like to point out uh, instead um, it's always difficult to box yourself, right, as you're still working on stuff. But what I see that a lot of recent work is going towards and how it's building on some notions or some concepts that come from this debate. So, um, for instance, uh, in terms of social reproduction connected to um, global development, um, I see uh, sort of uh, processes of recuperating some of uh, the early um, debate on value but to um, stretch this debate exponentially to speak for the world of work more in general. And I, I'm making this argument but I'm in very good company, of course uh, this is the context in which I met uh, academically Lynn and Shirisha and, and others and I think uh, pretty much this is uh, where I see uh, some of our main contributions located. So the early feminist literature argued that value is produced in the home because we make people. Right? We make and regenerate people in different ways and these people actually have, are the primary commodity then to be deployed in the capitalist system. This makes the basis of what would represent uh, 
reproduction as value producing according to this point of view. The home is still very much uh, the unit of analysis uh, in this context uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, while I find it useful, when I think about uh, the uh, people I work alongside with, um, informal workers, uh, and when I look at the, the data on the percentages of informal work uh, worldwide, I think that is only one part of the story. So, um, for instance, the ILO, the last estimates, gave us uh, uh, the percentage overall of informal labor in the Global South uh, at 69.5%. That would be Sub-Saharan Africa with over, well, set in the mid-70s. Uh, you have uh, Asia set in the mid-60s because of the incorporation of East Asia, which uh, traditionally give lower estimates. You have India standing up with over 90 within this category, you have the Middle East and so on and so forth, or above 60s. The percentage at world level, considering the amount of work that comes from the Global South, uh, is set at 61%. So 61 of the planet, this is the, what the data is telling you, labors informally. And when you understand or when you sort of uh, uh, look at the ways in, people, in which people work informally, in many cases you'll ha immediately have the sense of how reproduction has to be seen as value producing and very much incorporated into that labor. So it's not just an issue of uh, producing labor as you do unpaid stuff in your home, which rightly the comrades in the 1970s uh, focused on, but it's also a question of how is it that this reproductive work you do is central and fundamental to enable the very process of paid work outside the home. And to me this is very clear when you look at the ways in which uh, uh, the global informal proletariat works. So for instance, uh, people working on our t-shirts, jeans, uh, in factories, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, will enter a setup, uh, of course, uh, uh, um, over um, representing uh, Asia here, which is where all my work uh, um, has taken place, uh, but also part of Southern Europe, you have the uh, ways in which uh, uh, living arrangement work for this worker, they are central to the ways in which uh, value is extracted. So uh, the workers that we work along, alongside with in, in Delhi will mostly either live in dormitories or they will live in informal hamlets. Both are managed by labor contractors which are connected to the factories. This means that these workers can be recalled onto the assembly line every time that uh, the employers require them to do so and the employers know exactly where they work. So this uh, link uh, actually uh, shaped the ways in which uh, their labor intensity uh, is set. It sets the exploitation rates because it decides what your working day will be like and sets very clear criteria for payment. So it's not just how you live, it's actually how your entire work experience is structured. So it has to be understood as part of the process of generation of value. The second way in which uh, uh, this uh, uh, process of uh, compenetration of production and reproduction takes place so that they two together have to be seen as part of uh, the process of generation of value is uh, uh, through the process of labor circulation. So 80% of the workers that we worked on uh, in uh, the Indian garment sector uh, were rural migrant. This is the case also for the sector at the global level. So there is an overrepresentation of migrants coming from the rural countryside um, to work in, fac in global factories in different industrial areas. Um, of course, um, massively um, generalizing here and I'm happy to answer question on this, but this process of migration is a subsidy to employer because every time there is lean season or they don't have orders enough, workers can be employed. Otherwise, the moment they are not, families, households, villages reabsorb the labor force and so they work as a subsidy to employer and subsidies to the state in many cases. And then third, in many contexts you have the, um, in, in the current uh, word of, uh, of work 
uh, context. You do have uh, the regeneration of household labor, so you have a lot of uh, uh, homes and households which are spaces of work, so they're where actually uh, uh, people mostly work. Yeah. So it's very difficult to dis distinguish between the home as a unit of reproduction and the home as a unit of uh, production and uh, if you even try to do so with surveys you end up with a lot of inconsistencies because in for instance uh, to calculate costs it's impossible for you to calculate electric cost for the houses as a unit of production because it's pretty much the same as a household of, of a unit as a unit of consumption so in all of this i would say that if you look at the way in which the entirety of the world of work works not just the wageless we need to put forward an argument that social reproduction is part and parcel of what constitutes uh, uh, value. Now, I think all these lenses produce uh, a number of venue for political practice and political campaigning. And I think uh, while there is a chronology to these approaches, a lot of the campaigning that spurred from their work actually is still alive today. So as I said, wages against housework, for instance, uh, um, is uh, one of the um, early um, wages against housework is one of the early uh, ways in which the campaign was structured. It was in fact addressed to employers, so the argument was that employers uh, were de facto employing both the wage workers as well as his family and the reproductive contribution of uh, the women was central to how that wage uh, could be a survival wage for him that period. You have rehearsal uh, or like uh, adaptation of this argument now, for instance, with claims uh, uh, placed uh, on the state. Uh, and uh, some women, uh, some feminist groups uh, will uh, directly campaign for la renta basica, for the basic income, on the so lobbying the state to have this disbursement, so to have this uh, care uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, work, unpaid care work finally paid and recognized uh, while instead uh, others uh, still will also lobby instead uh, the uh, employers. So there is a very clear uh, link between uh, yesterday's political campaigning and today. And even in terms of the language, you find a great variety of language on these issues. I was talking to Ruth. Um, yesterday about this because uh, uh, many parts of uh, um, in many parts of the world feminists will call this self-determination income they will not call it basic income and uh, this speaks to struggles for instance in the Mediterranean where the organization of the debate around uh, um, basic income so citizenship uh, based rights is problematic because it excludes uh, uh, thousands and thousands of migrants that uh, reside and uh, labor um, in the country. It's a very tricky debate to have and of course it's one which is context specific but I think uh, uh, it's also falsely represented as an alternative to fighting for a better wage. We want the bread and the roses too, we used to say. We don't have to choose between uh, strategies in a sense. Um, so these are campaigns that can be uh, led in uh, um, liaising with different groups and uh, sort of they have to be uh, uh, sort of, uh, these are struggles that have to be articulated. And also, we need to start from the observation that in contexts where you do have a lot of wageless labor, an income based uh, claim cannot really be distinguished uh, uh, entirely from a wage based claim. So, for the wageless, uh, asking for income is asking for a wage. So, how where do you draw the line there is a very sort of tricky process. And the recognition of these linkages can lead to a lot of uh, strategic engagement uh, uh, politically with different groups. Now, the, the campaigning around um, wages. Uh, for housework is not the only way, in w so it's not the only type of political campaigning that has emerged from this literature. Another one where, you know, we recognize the leading um, sort of uh, um, um, 
we, we recognize that eco-feminist as leading uh, the way is instead towards the socialization of reproductive tasks and time. So the literature that connects this uh, with what we know as the commons. So rather than wanting to have unpaid activities waged, uh, to move towards uh, reclaiming spaces for collective action and collective work. Um, and uh, um, you have, uh, starting from Vandana Shiva or Ariel Salle, the current work of Stefania Barca and uh, uh, Silvia Federici and George Capensis go towards this particular, instead, form of campaigning. And again, you can see how, once again, you can and not see this uh, in competition with other claims that might be on wage support and might be instead on wages against housework because it depends also very much on the type of groups that uh, uh, um, organize and the, so the material realities of different uh, uh, groups of, of uh, uh, people. Now, social reproduction theory, on the other hand, has focused much less on uh, unpaid labor, so the politically productive nature of uh, um, unpaid labor or um, starting from the ecology and has focused instead far more on uh, classic labor struggles by reproductive workers. So they've been leading on strategies uh, to organize uh, teachers, uh, to organize uh, uh, young doctors, uh, to organize uh, forms of reproductive work which are not unpaid but they're being commodified in very adversarial terms and they're very poorly paid in different parts of uh, the uh, uh, global economy. There's been a massive campaign in the United States uh, um, and uh, um, in Eastern Europe, and I learned uh, uh, very sort of uh, eagerly this morning about the very low wages paid by health workers uh, in the context of um, Ghana, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, um, so this uh, type of uh, uh, instead classic labor campaigning, but in support of specifically uh, specifically uh, marginalized groups, is what also as uh, um, uh, you know social instead different approaches to social reproduction has uh, led um, uh, to. Now. In the context of uh, Latin America in particular, and with the rise of the new Una Menos movement, there has been a lot of debates on how to instead reclaim all the space together. So how you speak a language that can be recognized both by workers who are unpaid and unwaged, as well as uh, 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 by workers uh, um, instead uh, have a wage in the context of the reproductive economy and there's a very poor wage and uh, the um, the work of uh, Veronica Gago in this respect is to me what stands out uh, so how to we can rethink uh, so a lot of process of rethinking has gone through the category of analysis and how we define different processes. Well, now a lot of work can be also go into redefining the instruments of struggle. So she has done a lot of work on what she defines the feminist struggle, sorry, the feminist strike. Uh, so how is it that you can uh, uh, strike in context uh, instead that are characterized uh, by wageless uh, um, uh, work. So to conclude, um, the, um, the it's uh, um, when we talk about social reproduction analysis, we talk about a plurality of uh, approaches, which uh, uh, try to sort of uh, reclaim theory in ways that centers uh, feminist understanding uh, and the start uh, from the reorganization of life as opposed to the reorganization of work and how the two processes are connected uh, uh, to each other.
There are a variety of approaches to social reproduction as we have seen and I think uh, the, um, their centrality not just as theoretical tools but as uh, guiding tools for political practice is what I find uh, particularly relevant in this uh, uh, um, particular uh, literature. And they shape different ways in which we can think of uh, struggles um, as um, you know we have mentioned in the, the last slides and uh, so how you know you can think about a feminist practice uh, in different contexts depending on the type of uh, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, political campaigning in which uh, you are uh, involved in and finally I want to say that um, it's also what social reproduction, the attention to social reproduction is giving us is also a, a different lens on how we can reorient classic struggles towards social reproduction terrains, particularly in contexts where the world of work uh, continues to be characterized by high level of precarization and very little stay on in the, the same place of work. So for instance, in India we are doing a lot of work trying to organize uh, workers or like capture the experiences of garment workers uh, and other types of workers from uh, reproductive realms that might be dormitories, might be hamlets, might be the village of origins because uh, sometimes workers stay in the same place of work for less than uh, a year. So basically how to focus on social reproduction is also a way to rethink uh, classic ways in which we organize, uh, we can organize uh, struggles uh, from the point of view of labor uh, um, more broadly. Thank you. Thank you.